Index on Censorship. Um, my name is Podrick Reedy. I'm uh, the senior writer at Index on Censorship, and I'm joined by Rebecca McKinnon, who is the author of Consent of the Networked, and Trevor Tim, who um, works at Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, we're going to be talking about the thing that's really dominated uh, the conversations about privacy and free speech for, for months now. Um, the National Security Agency, PRISM, and everything else involved, the Edward Snowden, everything else involved in that. Um, Trevor, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think a lot of people, and to be honest, myself included, are still quite confused by the, the technical jargon surrounding the PRISM program. Could you maybe try and sum up in, in layman's terms what exactly is happening, how long it's been happening, and why we should be concerned, really? Sure. Well, there's really two separate programs we're talking about here. Uh, one is the, the first court order that was revealed by The Guardian on June 7th. Uh, and now this dealt with uh, metadata uh, for all phone call records in the U.S. The, the court order actually only dealt with Verizon customers, uh, but it was since revealed that it's basically all the major cell phone providers. And what the NSA is basically getting is every... A uh, person that you've called, every person that's called you, uh, for how long your conversations went on for, uh, and when they happened. And mm -hmm. so this, you know, the, it, and it's not the content of the conversation; it's this metadata. But this metadata is actually uh, very revealing. You know, it can reveal all sorts of information about your movements and uh, your associations, whether we're talking about your political, religious, or uh, any other sort of associations, your closest friends and family. Uh, basically, a, a, a map can be created of your life just through disinformation uh, without ever looking at the content of your your phone calls. And so this information was, was uh, wholly domestic. So even if it, it, you know, they collected everything from if you were making international calls to uh, just uh, calls within the U.S. And this was kept completely secret from the, from the American citizens for seven years since the FISA court, uh, the secret FISA court started authorizing this type of mass collection. And, uh, you know, we have known about aspects of this program for about six years now. Uh, back in late 2005, 2006, the New York Times was started reporting on the Bush administration warrantless wiretapping program. And it made huge headlines back then, and there was huge outrage. Unfortunately, Congress has passed laws that have largely uh, at least legalized or painted this veneer of legality over some of this, even though we believe it's been unconstitutional from the start, uh, and it's really faded from the headlines. But now these court documents have really uh, proved that it's going on once and for all. This is the first time we've actually had government documents uh, showing the American people exactly uh, the type of surveillance that's going on. Uh, and so, so Getting back to your original question, that was the first program, and now there's the second program uh, that a lot of people are calling PRISM. And this deals with uh, internet companies and their partnership with the N NSA, so Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Yahoo, uh, and others, which are uh, forced by the FISA court under the FISA Amendments Act to hand over large quantities of data on people in the U.S. talking to uh, foreigners. Uh, the, the targets of these uh, FISA court orders are, uh, by law, required to be uh, people in foreign countries, except it's all people there, it, all the conversations they're uh, vacuuming up is, is with people in the U.S. So there is a half of the the conversation that is should be protected by a probable cause warrant in this country, yet the NSA is getting through these broad surveillance orders, which they can basically target at groups of people. They don't have to name the individuals. They could say, you know, we want all of the communications going in and out of a town in uh, Pakistan or Yemen or Russia or any country that deals with, with foreign intelligence. And this is, you know, incredibly broad. It doesn't have to be terrorism. Uh, it can be basically, if you're talking politics with somebody overseas, this could be fall under this definition. And so these companies are giving uh, the NSA a, a certain subset of data, we don't know how large, and which allows the NSA to query this data as, as long as, uh, for as much information as they want for up to a year's time. And again, all of this has been happening in secret without the American people really knowing that it's going on. And it raises huge constitutional issues, which the 
the government has unfortunately been trying to avoid in court by getting lawsuits dismissed through all sorts of procedural maneuvers, including attempting to get ours dismissed. And finally, this is this is shed light on these programs that we have been uh, wanting to see for some time, and hopefully now that we have this information, uh, more court cases can go forward, and that Congress can actually act and start uh, trying to protect people's privacy. Rebecca, um, a lot of people are maybe more skeptical about the the Guardian and the the Washington Post um, and other out there. Der Spiegel has been very prominent on this. We'll say, you know, Trevor mentioned you know, Google, Facebook, all the Yahoo, all these companies, and people will say, well, we hand over a lot of information to these companies anyway. Should we be surprised that that the government should want to access it? Uh, well, there's there's a couple of things here, and I, I just want to back up on uh, to, to frame um, a bit of what Trevor was talking about, which I think is is one of the most upsetting things internationally uh, about this whole situation, is that Trevor is is talking about concern in the United States about violation of Americans' constitutional right, rights, but these programs have been set up in such a way in which you know, regardless of whether they're doing a good enough job at protecting Amer American people's privacy rights, uh, non-American internet users are basically considered to have no rights under these mm -hmm. uh, under this system, uh, and and so you have a situation where U.S. law, um, if it were followed properly, and if the, if the Constitution were respect were respected. Uh, you, you might be protecting American people's rights, but you'd still not have any obligations uh, either on the part of, of you know the, the U.S. government or the other actors in, in this uh, situation to actually protect the rights of non-Americans. And you know, given that we have international human rights law, there's an international declaration of human rights. Um, it, you know, if the rights of some internet users of um, services like Google and Yahoo and Facebook and Twitter, if the rights of, of users, non-American users, are not protected in the same way or respected or given the same weight as the rights of American citizens, so the whole notion of a globally inter interconnected internet on which you know the US government has claimed you know human rights should extend to the internet and and of course human rights are supposed to be global but then on the other hand it's treating rights of different types of citizens differently and this is a tremendous contradiction and it's a real problem for US companies that whose business is now growing primarily globally you know, it's fairly saturated in the United States. Facebook's growth is, is stagnant, stagnant in the U.S. and a lot of developed countries, and the developing world is where all the growth is. And if users of these services feel that they're second-class citizens on any service that is headquartered in the United States or whose data is stored in the United States or runs through the United States, that's a huge problem. Uh, now, should people care? Uh, Yes, I, I think people should care. Um, I mean, I myself have spent time living in countries where surveillance is pervasive and unaccountable, and and it certainly um, results in human rights abuses taking place that that have you know a real physical impact on people's lives and well-being and and physical freedom. Uh, and I think that you have a slippery slope. And what what rights are about and what democracy is about and what our kind of personal liberties and freedoms are about ultimately is that it, it's about power and who is exercising power right and so yes we're we're kind of trading some freedom and giving some agency to these platforms and networks that are regulated by governments um, in exchange for convenience and services and so on but if that relationship is not accountable, if power over us can be abused, if we have no way of counteracting that abuse, about knowing who is, is committing the abuse, um, if, we know, if we have no way of delivering consequences upon those people abusing their power over our digital lives, 
it's going to be very difficult to, in this world where people are increasingly dependent on digital platforms and services for everything, it's going to be very difficult to advocate for human rights or achieve protections of human rights in the physical world. It's very much connected. Mm -hmm. And so we have a real problem when, you know, U.S.-based services are subject to a legal regime, um, which itself is being abused, um, which does not hold human rights to be equally applicable to all human beings, uh, you know, who use internet services. And it's, um, you know, I, I think this brings to a head the problem that you can't just sort of country by country you kind of set up your own regulations uh, and expect rights to be protected on the internet. Um, it's it's much more seamless than that. You know, some governments are reacting by saying, okay, we're going to have to have sort of national networks and, and require the data be stored locally. Um, but that's not ultimately the solution, given that services end up, people want to use these services to communicate all over the world. Um, and you still have to hold those governments accountable for abuses that if they're not admitting to committing, they're lying. Um, yes. You know, there, there are accountability issues with, you know, every government that regulates the Internet these days mm -hmm. um, to various degrees. Um, and, and so at least amongst the democratic nations that, that actually have made commitments to global human rights, to human rights on the internet, and have committed to the notion that human rights extends to the internet, we need to bring sort of domestic, legal, regulatory, and law enforcement regimes that relate to digital networks into line with international human rights standards. Otherwise, the internet is is just you know um, it's just not going to it's going to become a shadow of, of what it might potentially be. Uh, Trevor, um, Rebecca raises a good point there. How much has this um, has the have these revelations affected the ability of particularly the United States, but also as you see other countries have been implicated in this, such as such as the UK. How much does that undermine um, their ability to to talk about human rights, to talk about surveillance? to undemocratic countries. Yeah, I think it's a real concern that really hasn't been touched on in a lot of the mainstream media stories on this that uh, you know it it really hurts our ability to criticize countries like Russia and China who uh, may be trying to implement these types of surveillance systems uh, on their citizens uh, when we're doing much the same thing now. You know, obviously, they may be targeting uh, activists and dissidents uh, much more overtly than the U.S. is. Uh, but uh, when the system is set up this in the generally the same way, uh, which allows for the same abuse, uh, then it's hard to have a leg to stand on. Uh, you know, the same thing uh, can be said for the companies, which haven't really uh, been upfront with the their customers uh, since these scandals uh, broke. You know, now since uh, this information is out into the public, they have been petitioning the FISA court to release more information, to be more transparent, which is great. Uh, but unfortunately, I think a lot of their customers feel a little betrayed. And, it, you know, it, this also goes to you know, how their business is going to operate going forward. Are people going to trust them overseas with their data? And, uh, you know, I think it is in their best business interest, uh, let alone the interest of their users for them to to come clean is exactly how they're cooperating with the NSA and, and exactly how they're pushing back against these surveillance orders and uh, better inform their users about uh, when their privacy rights can and can't be violated. Mm -hmm. we've, we've, seen, we've seen a similar debate um, in the past few years um, happening over prospective um, legislation in the UK on the Communications Data Bill, which is widely known as the, um, the Snoopers Charter. Um, and that allows, <coughs> or that proposes to allow um, access to a vast amount of, 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 of metadata. Um, 
to, you know, the, I think what people find really worrying with this is to basically unnamed authorities. So you can have you know, any number of, of state authorities could potentially be licensed to, um, to get data relating and from everything from, from your email to actually posted letters still. Um, it's a that it's it's a real trend, and I always feel sometimes, uh, and I'm going to put this to Rebecca that sometimes surveillance um, on the web, um, just as censorship on the web, doesn't seem somehow as insidious to people. It's it because exactly because it's so easy to do, it seems like it's not a problem. Like the 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 symbol always, always uses. It's you know like. If you said, uh, you know, people have no problem whatsoever, web page has been taken down. But if you compare it to burning books, suddenly it becomes a, re a real issue. It's, it's, it's apparently because the technology is so easy that governments almost feel entitled to, to do this. Well, they can get away with it because people don't know what's happening. They don't notice it. It's not creating, you know, speed bumps as they navigate the Internet for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and and so th this is the problem and has always been the problem with surveillance generally you know there's an attitude amongst there's always an attitude amongst a significant part of a population you 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 hear this from people not just in democracies but you know i know people in china who said this to me i'm not doing anything wrong so it doesn't matter mm -hmm. um, but you know the, the research has shown certainly um, I mean even you know in democracies that that attitude is is of course even more prevalent uh, but when it comes to um, uh, minority communities communities of color that tend to be uh, closer targets of surveillance you begin to see exactly how insidious that becomes mm -hmm. that uh, you know if, if you if you're in a particular kind of community and your data that's being collected is then subject to certain algorithms and analysis that so you don't even know kind of what's going on and it ends up in and you know the, these companies the, the, the government too is sort of combining this with commercially obtained data and so on oftentimes there are errors in this data you can you can result this can result in a person end up being linked through some kind of analysis that nobody knows about to terrorists when they are not a terrorist being put on lists um, having this you know results in them not getting jobs not getting clearances uh, for certain kinds of jobs all kinds of you know potentially wrongfully arrested put on no-fly lists etc cetera, etc cetera. there are all kinds of ways in in which um, pervasive surveillance that does not have sufficient checks on abuse and on mistakes um, it can end up affecting innocent people uh, and can end up chilling um, people's people's uh, you know uh, comfort with having controversial opinions uh, or 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 just unusual tastes because they're concerned that they will trigger an algorithm that will cause trouble for them in some way. That's that's not how a free society is supposed to work. Um, yet you can't if if you you know in a, in a democratic society you need to be in a position that even if there are some things you know for for instance um, you know let let's let's take a community that. Uh, for instance, is lobbying to change a law on something, and because they think that law is unjust, right? Mm -hmm. um, but because they oppose a particular law, law enforcement is interested in them. You know, so be that you know people who are trying to legalize certain drugs, or people who want to legalize being able to marry more than one person, or or you know, in some states, you know, being able to marry somebody of your own gender, for instance, you know, uh, and and it, it, you know, you need to be able to feel comfortable to exercise your freedom of assembly and freedom of speech around opposing kind of the status quo um, peacefully on things that you think are unjust um, and that may be currently illegal, but which you want 
to convince a significant number of people in society that that, should, that, that law should change. And if you have pervasive surveillance uh, and excessively loose access by law enforcement to data about people who are just talking about some, uh, about like not liking certain laws, Mm -hmm. um, that is tremendous, has a tremendous chilling effect on people's ability to organize against laws they feel are unjust. Yeah. And, and so, so that, that's an example of why this is so critical, even in a democracy where, you know, you don't have people being stopped and arrested and taken and getting tortured, you know, on the street uh, on a regular basis the way they did, say, in like Mubarak's Egypt or something. Um, but it, it, it's still, it, you know, you can't see it on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you might not have neighbors who have kind of been through this experience, but nonetheless, in aggregate, it makes the society less free, more oppressive, and perpetuates tyrannies of, of the majority. Yeah, I would just like to underscore that point a little bit. I think there's just uh, a really great point that has been... Uh, kind of push to the side of this. Obviously there's uh, huge privacy implications when it comes to this type of surveillance, but uh, there are also free speech implications in this right of association which uh, Rebecca was referring to. And actually uh, EFF just filed a lawsuit on Tuesday which emphasizes this First Amendment right to association. You know, back in the late 1950s and 1960s there are several great uh, Supreme Court opinions in the U.S. Uh, that talk about this right of association. One called NAACP versus Alabama, where a group was uh, was being uh, the NAACP was being sued, and in discovery, uh, the uh, opposing party tried to compel uh, them to hand over their membership lists. And they argued successfully in court that uh, handing over this membership list would chill their free speech because once people know who they associate with, uh, they will then be more afraid to do so in the future. And, you know, these cases are still good law. Uh, unfortunately, they've kind of uh, been thrown to the wayside and, and ha haven't been... Uh, really updated for the digital age, and that's what we hope to accomplish with our lawsuit. You know, a lot of the groups that, that the type of groups that Rebecca just mentioned, uh, groups that are trying to push for drug laws, uh, or gun rights, or environmental rights, or human rights. Uh, human Rights Watch is actually one of our our plaintiffs, and uh, so on behalf of all of these groups, we filed suit against the NSA, saying that they're actually violating people's right to association by collecting all of this metadata on, you know, who is calling these organizations, who these organizations are calling, and how often, uh, because this can, by itself, uh, chill somebody's free speech and make it less likely that they'll want to uh, associate with these groups when they know it's possible the government has some sort of list that, that keeps track of, of who's talking to who. Yeah, we saw um, <coughs> recently, um, so we were talking about freedom of association on the web as a right. Um, we saw recently, um, there was another, another revelation in The Guardian quite separate to this one, but again about surveillance in the UK, um, and you both just reminded me of the story of um, the, the, there was a, a campaign for um, a young man called Stephen Lawrence who was, who was murdered um, and his family were campaigning for justice and for a proper inquiry into the police investigation and so on. Um, and it was revealed recently that the police, among many other groups, uh, which they had infiltrated, environmentalist groups and so on, had infiltrated this campaign for... Um, for justice for, for the victim of a murder, which, which was just horrified a lot of people. Um, but it got me thinking as well about, you know, from our point of view, obviously, you know, as people who are concerned about free speech and privacy, and as normal citizens, um, this this is obviously troubling that, that all this data about who we're, who we're talking to is being collected. But I wonder also, does it make for, you know, Bad, you know, and, and Rebecca was touching it, and they're talking about people wrongly caught up in things. Does it make for bad intelligence as well? Is it is it a very inefficient way, if we must have spies, of going about spying and and carrying out surveillance? It, it, well, that's that's a good question. I mean, I I think it it certainly maximizes the chance for errors when you're just kind of hoovering things up and 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 you don't have 
um, a lot of supervision on what's happening or what data is being connect, connect, collected from where. Um, it, you know, I mean, I recently kind of looked up sort of what could be found on me from a commercial background check, and I found a bunch of errors. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of errors out there in the system just from randomly collecting data. Um, it, you know, but then I think intelligence agencies have always kind of been error prone. Uh, my my parents um, a couple decades ago wrote a biography of somebody who had been subject to surveillance in the United States um, in the early part of last century, and they got her FBI files, and it was mm. full of of errors. <laughs> um, it, you know, just the things that were sort of hearsay that had been collected. And, and then repeat it as facts. Uh, so, uh, I mean, in a way, I guess intelligence is, is always error prone, and because it's secret and, and not subject to scrutiny, um, you know, the errors get repeated and entrenched and institutionalized in, in rather frightening ways, which is, a, a, again, why sort of unfettered, unchecked surveillance. Um, yeah, it, it's it's certainly not serving citizens and, and, and probably making it harder to be actually accurate in, in catching people who really are terrorists or criminal, criminals. So I'm going to ask um, Trevor, um, obviously EFF, as you mentioned, have been very involved in, in the cases about freedom of association and free speech on the web. Um, what do... Um, citizens in the United States do now to to protect their rights and, and to fight for their rights and, and what, what's EFF's um, course of action next? Well, uh, like I had mentioned before, we just filed a lawsuit on Tuesday uh, arguing that this violates everybody's First Amendment right to freedom of association, but we actually already have a lawsuit that's been going on for six years over the warrantless surveillance program. You know, this first came to the public's attention in 2005 and 2006 under the Bush administration, and unfortunately the government has been throwing up these procedural roadblocks for years now, arguing that we did, first we didn't have standing, you know, we couldn't uh, prove that uh, any of our plaintiffs were, were being privacy was being violated. Uh, we jumped over that hurdle and now we're dealing with the government arguing that the uh, the case should be dismissed because it's a quote-unquote state secret. That even if their argument is basically that even if all of our allegations are true about unconstitutional behavior, the court should dismiss it without even hearing the evidence uh, because it touches on sensitive national security claims. Uh, luckily a, a district court judge, judge actually just rejected that argument and allowed our suit to go forward. So right now we have two of these active lawsuits going on and and, uh, but what citizens can do is uh, actually uh, contact their congressman. For the first time in years, Congress actually cares about this issue. You know, they have been uh, reauthorizing the laws that the the NSA has been using to justify these programs, the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act. In the last few years, there's been little to no debate uh, as Congress has just pushed through these laws for, for three or five more years. And now it, it seems that they have realized what's actually going on and that they never were getting uh, the full amount of information before, and they actually seem very angry about it. You know, even the author of the Patriot Act, uh, Republican Jim Sensenbrenner, who has never been accused of being a civil libertarian, is saying that the NSA has uh, gone outside the scope of the law, and this is not what Congress had intended. It even threatened to not reauthorize it uh, if they didn't change their practices immediately. So uh, the best thing the American public can do is call their member of Congress to explain to them this is a huge issue to them and to continue pushing for more disclosures. You know, unfortunately, we still don't know the full scope of these surveillance programs. A uh, representative... Uh, Representative Sanchez, uh, from, a Democrat from Maryland, uh, emerged from a classified briefing about a month ago saying that the, the disclosures in the media are actually just the quote-unquote tip of the iceberg. So, uh, you know, it's important that we bring more transparency to these issues because without the transparency, we don't know how to fix the laws. You know, the, the administration has been secretly interpreting the Patriot Act and even the Fourth Amendment uh, without the American public knowing how. And, you know, it's just antithetical to democracy to think that our public laws has, have secret interpretations that no one can know except for a handful of people within the government.
And Rebecca, <clears throat> what can we do internationally, um, your, your non-US citizen, what can we do to, to defend our privacy and what do we need to do to defend our privacy? Well, there's a, there's a number of things. Um, one is just if, if your government has made commitments to internet freedom, has made commitments to human rights, if your government claims to be a democracy, you should use you know, all of the traditional political levers of a citizen to make your views known and, and to make it clear that you don't want politicians representing you that do not represent your values. Um, and, you know, we need the, the world's democracies at very least. Uh, democracies that have made commitments on internet freedom to be updating and strengthening legal standards that will ensure that when surveillance happens that it is done in a manner that is accountable, that that can be constrained, that when abuses happen, they that something can be done about them. Um, you know that that is absolutely critical, uh, and also making sure. And this this is a critical piece that that Trevor mentioned. The laws need to allow companies to be able to report on what they're handing over to governments. We need transparency from companies. Um, about what what they're handing over and the kinds of requests they're receiving and we need transparency from governments about the demands they're making uh, the types of demands they're making and, and the scope of demands they're making and that's absolutely critical if citizens are going to understand sort of how how power is being exercised over us so we can hold both companies and governments accountable and there are projects now, you know, that are trying to do a better job of tracking what different companies are doing. You know, some companies are issuing transparency reports. There's starting to be more research on the part of investors and, and other groups to really track what commitments have different companies made on human rights, in, including free expression and privacy, and what are they doing to uphold those commitments. Um, and, and so people should be, you know, picking and choosing what services they use based on the kinds of commitments and policies that these services have. And likewise, you know, a lot of these companies are listed on stock exchanges, you know, they're in investor port portfolios, you know, just as increasingly investors care about, you know, they don't want to invest in companies that that are environmentally bad or that abuse their workers and so on. They're they're socially responsible investment funds. You know, ask, ask, you know, look for investment funds that include free expression and privacy uh, uh, among their criteria. Um, we need to exercise all the levers, political levers, commercial levers, and, and also activist levers, you know, speak out, make it clear that this is known. But we also need a lot more education in society, you know. Uh, people, you know, teachers in school are, are not you know, as part of civics, as, as part of media literacy, kind of aspects of how our data is being shared, by whom, and how it's being collected, people just don't understand. And we do need a more educated society on these issues and what's happening with our information and to us in our digital lives if, if we're going to be able to defend our own rights. And, and so there's, there's a whole kind of set of, of things we need to do. There are also issues with, you know, there, there are certain kinds of companies that are selling surveillance and um, censorship, you know, specialized software and equipment um, around the world. That ty those types of sales, those types of technologies need to be controlled. There's very little regulation on them. Um, so there are, you know, a lot of things we need to do, but as individuals, we do have power. If we didn't have power, uh, the, the United Kingdom would still be an absolute monarchy, uh, and and you know, there there never would have been democracy. We have democracy in the world today, as imperfect as it is, because citizens exercise some power. Um, and so, I'm optimistic in the long run that. People can exercise power and hold governments and companies accountable to a greater degree than is currently the case. But, you know, it's, it's not easy and it requires a bit of fighting sometimes.
Okay, well, I think that, that's a great note to end on, and we better get fighting. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca McKinnon, and thank you, Trevor Tim, um, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having us.